Hello, and a healthy day to all our viewers. Welcome to Health Issues. I'm Dr. Teddy Herbosa, a trauma surgeon, an academic and faculty from the College of Medicine of the University of the Philippines, Manila. From 2010 to 2015, the university lent me to the Department of Health as an Undersecretary of Health, where we implemented health reforms for the Philippine health system. This educational series on health systems and health policies and health reforms are critical as our country aims to provide health equity and quality health care to our citizens from all socioeconomic sectors through a robust and efficient universal health coverage that all governments aspire to attain. Our health system has long mirrored the health system in the United States of America, which has now become the most expensive healthcare system in the world. In the early 1990s, our government officials decided that we can no longer uh, copy the American model of an expensive healthcare for a high-income country, but develop our system through one involving greater health equity for the poor and the disadvantaged. After our government decided to follow the Bismarck model of social protection and created the National Health Insurance Act of 1994, which eventually formed the Philippine Health Insurance Corporation, it was uh, Health Secretary Alberto Quasi Romualdez that initiated health reform agenda in an environment of a decentralized health system. He, this predated the national health insurance. And by 2010, which was supposed to have been the deadline for universal health coverage by PhilHealth, only 54% of the population was enrolled. Also, the support value of PhilHealth was a low 30% of the total cost of healthcare, making our citizens spend a ton of money on out-of-pocket expenses. It was in this environment that we formulated the DOH program of Kalusugan Pangkalahatan, directly translated as Health for All. We passed and revised the syntax law that allocated 85% of syntax revenues to health care. This was critical reform in health financing that fueled a resurgence for better health outcomes of the people. Recently, we have passed a comprehensive universal health coverage law. The Office of the President is due to sign this any moment. Our series will do uh, and discuss many of the uh, complex issues of health reform in a developing health system. In this episode, we have as our guest Dr. Emerita Faraon, a professor of health policy at the College of Public Health in the University of the Philippines, Manila. We also have Dr. Carmen Cita Padilla, the Chancellor of the University of the Philippines, Manila, a medical doctor, geneticist, and research advocate. And to my right is Dr. Tony Boy Faraon. He's uh, the Vice President of the Zwilig Family Foundation, a non-government organization that has pushed itself to improve the health outcomes of our people. They will help us understand all the health policies in our country today. So let me start with the first question and I'll invite anyone to actually dig in. What do you think are the public health policy issues that our health system needs to tackle as a priority reform? Um, good afternoon to everyone. Uh, I think uh, uh, the most uh, important right now is to address the policies directed to sustaining the currently uh, enacted universal health care bill. Um, it also deals with uh, giving how to ensure that our people get that universal health coverage that they want. So uh, the approach, as you know, uh, we have been discussing that in the academy, we have been teaching that to our students, is the six building blocks. Mm -hmm. So the six building blocks, uh, uh, of course, the most important is governance. Uh, there are already existing uh, policies here, but in the light of the new law, uh, certain things must contribute to uh, um, making sure that it is being given that all Filipinos are already covered. So uh, these are human resources, health information system, health regulation, and uh, um, uh, I think there is already now a fixed HTAC, it's the HTA Center. Health. Health technology uh, assessment. Yes, mm -hmm. and the health human resources. Health human resources. I, I think it's being addressed also by the uh, uh, by the law, and uh, the financing would be very very different uh, now. So, what are the existing uh, public health policies? Are there 
in place? Do we have to make them? I think that's the next thing to do. So those are the things that we Correct. should so be addressing. The, the way I look at it is like uh, making the airplane, flying it, and then as it flies, you're trying to make all the changes in the airplane. Yes. Uh, Chancellor mentioned, okay, how does the uh, academe contribute to all these health system changes and health system reforms happening and all the gaps, some of the gaps that have been mentioned? Actually, the... Uh University of the Philippines, Manila, UP Manila, is a major partner of the Department of Health as we prepare these changes in the country. In relation to the universal health uh, coverage law that we have at hand, they have commissioned uh, UP Manila to conduct roundtable discussions on priority issues. So right now we have a series um, uh, where in, in each roundtable discussion, we bring in the stakeholders and uh, try to get the ideas that are necessary to be included into the implementing rules and regulations. And I think that's very important because uh, we have very limited data in relation to, to the concepts and reforms that we want. So the stakeholders now are able to voice their, their ideas into, the, into this platform and hopefully give it now to the Department of Health. I mean, that's, that's one uh, immediate angle that I'm looking at. But going down the line, I think the university, and not only UP Manila, but all universities, will have to uh, ensure that our next generation of health managers have these new concepts in place. Mm -hmm. And that means that we have to update our curricula, we have to update, we have to come up with courses, workshops, to ensure that all the health managers from the high position to the low position are actually aligned as far as the, uh, the guidelines set by the implementing rules and regulations. Correct. So, so you're saying what's important is data and we, 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 need, we all know that when we make policies and we make changes, it's got to be evidence-based. So the role of the University of the Philippines Manila seems to be to, to generate that data and analyze analyze that data and be able to come up with solutions to gaps that you mentioned, gaps in the six pillars, whether it's human resources, whether it's healthcare delivery, whether it's financing. Yes. So Dr. Dad, I'm, I really want to bring in the whole community of uh, colleges and universities on board because I think this is one, generating data should be an effort of everybody in the academe. Uh, the gaps have to be identified, budget should be given so that we can get the hard data. Without the hard data, we cannot generate good policies. So one of the messages we want to send out to the community now is that if you want good policies to come out, then help us generate the data that's needed by the Department of Health. Correct. It's the era of uh, data science and all this accumulation. Mm -hmm. How about you, Tony Boy? Uh, you work with a non-government organization and you go farthest, in fact, uh, uh, they're, they're, the non-government organizations are often forgotten in the formulation of health systems. I've often heard that in my own field in disaster medicine, the private sector. Why did you not include us in your plans when you were changing? So can you tell us more about what you do at the Swilling Family Foundation? Yeah, th thank you, Ted. Um, well, basically, I think there's really a big role for non-government organizations and the private sector to play in this whole scheme of things, especially in relation to universal health care. Um, as we follow the government that they keep on saying that it should be a whole of government and a whole of society approach, um, non-government organizations really do play a big role um, in maybe I, I should say three things. One is really in relation to advocacy. Um, second is in relation to supporting the many players or the main players, I should say, like the Department of Health, Field Health, and local government units in terms of the implementation. And thirdly, in terms of um, engaging the communities to really um, participate um, in this, in this, in this um, new uh, law. In the Zwilig Family Foundation, we support the Department of Health uh, in partnership with, academ with the academe um, in developing local leaders um, in terms of their leadership capacities and their management capacities. And for them to really prioritize health as an issue and be able to invest and do responsive programs for their communities. So in the foundation, we have what we call the Health Leadership and Governance Program in partnership with the Department of Health and many academic partners such as the University of the Philippines to train these local health leaders, uh, improve their governance, and be able to come up with responsive programs. That's right. No? Uh, what we're seeing with what Zwilling Family Foundation does is that 
we now know that healthcare is not only delivered by the health professionals. It's actually delivered also by local chief executives. And that's the, the group you actually target. You're able to explain to small town mayors and small town local chief executives why it's important to vaccinate the children, why it's important to give them maternal care, why it's important to have an ambulance that will bring them to the nearest hospital for definitive care. Correct. Um, and in so doing, they're able also to invest and um, um, be able to provide these services to, to, to their constituencies. Okay. Ted, so, I, I think, you know, this program, the Health Leadership um, governance and Governance program. program, is an excellent example of a uh, private-public partnership yes. because um, we know our strength and we know where we can help. And uh, it is one program that can, that can probably be expanded to cover all the local chief executives actually in the country. So it is a model that, uh, that's worth duplicating for the rest of the, the Philippines. Uh, maybe for the information of our viewers, Manchit, let's talk about the National Institutes of Health. Because I know you were formerly the executive director of that before. Or you, 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 from the time it was born to the time it passed as a she law was there. To, uh, to, the, to the today, where it's now creating a new building and how many? 22 institutes or something? Uh, uh, tell us more about it and tell the viewer what the National Institutes of Health at the University of the Philippines, Manila, can contribute to health systems reform, uh, health reforms, health services? Okay, so let me just start by saying that the National Institutes of Health is really a, a family of 10 institutes ranging from child health, aging, genetics, epidemiology, health policy, and so on, and four centers. Although it is housed at the UP Manila, actually it's only a home, but it's meant to cover the national need, the national priorities in terms of research. The, the role of NIH is to provide data so that to the government so that we can come up with good policies. So we do have some good examples right now. Um, when we talk about research output, I'm not just talking about publication. So you want publications so that that is for the academe and uh, for our work to be vetted out by local and international peers. But we're looking for products. And for the information of everyone, the citations that we get at UP Manila are actually pulling the university. Yes, in its, thank you. Uh, right, right, yes. right. So the products that produce, uh, for instance, Lagundi is one. We yes. have Sambong. Sambong. Uh, we have the diagnostic kit for, for dengue. So we have a series of products that we are giving to the country so that they can be affordable to the ordinary right. Filipino. But the other thing that we're contributing actually is data that will be converted to policy. So we yes. do have policies generated out of uh, uh, NIH. Of course, one is my program, the newborn, newborn screening, screening program that is now supported by the Newborn Screening Act of 2004. We have hearing. 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 Uh, the hearing data has been used as the guide, as the basis for the, the law on oh. newborn hearing screening. We have the rare disease law that was also based on data coming out of NIH. And of course, we've been supportive of, we're now an advocate of uh, the universal health care coverage uh, uh, law plus the tobacco, the syntax and so on. So actually, NIH is a, is a home not only to UP but to, to many organizations in, in the whole country so that we can produce the data that we can give actually to government. Correct. In fact, most of the funding source really comes from our Department of Science and Technology through the Philippine Council for Health Research and Development. So it's government science and technology money, and it's a G2G program wherein scientists from National Institutes of Health will do the priority researches, the national research, Unif unified, unified research, health research, health research agenda. agenda yes. So that's, what, that was, that's also the mandate of that NIH. So it's become a very important uh, uh, unit, uh, institute in the uh, University of the Philippines, Manila, and the University of the Philippines as a whole. Uh, Emmer, so let's go to public health and how public health was practiced in the Philippines, maybe a bit of history, because our professors in public health were former advisors of former secretaries of health as well. And you've seen, you also were uh, working in the Department of Health at the time when uh, Undersecretary Belisario was actually there. So. Tell me from the historical perspective how all this, how the College of Public Health has been playing its role in terms of all the reforms that's been happening. Even the key points, maybe 
key points of contributions, or maybe even I'd like to see things that didn't work so well, maybe uh, ideas, uh, because we learn a lot in academia. We learn from our failures. We learn on things or projects that we proposed but were never implemented and everything. Uh, so <clears throat> I think it was uh, born in 1927. So 19... Institute, Institute, right? No, it was uh, called, the, uh, it was actually part of the, the, the College of Medicine. College of Medicine. Medicine. Yeah. So it was Dr. Hilario Lara, Lara during that time. So Dr. Hilario Lara, Lara was uh, prominent. It was a national scientist and actually a faculty of the College of Medicine. And um, <clears throat> of course, there was the, the drive to <clears throat> uh, separate uh, eventually and uh, go... Uh, uh, to it was it was called the hygiene uh, uh, at, at first an institute of hygiene institute of hygiene that's but it was Dr Hilario Lara and that's why our hall is called the Lara, the hall. Lara hall so it was named after him but he was the one who pioneered it and I think part of the it was not called the Department of Health at that time it was called the Board of Health so uh, there were money given for Dr Lara to go uh, abroad I think it was Johns Hopkins. And uh, uh, eventually, the building that you see now, our College of Public Health, it's actually a donation by the Rockefeller Foundation. So uh, it was actually uh, history creating itself. <clears throat> so um, uh, there, there were there now currently because it's 92 years old, uh, um, several departments. So public health is actually health policy and administration to which I belong to. There's uh, health promotion and education. On the second floor, that, uh, there's the epidemiology, biostatistics, nutrition. Third floor, you have microbiology and parasitology. Last but not the least, so we call it the seven dwarfs, actually. And of course, the dean is there to head every uh, department. Uh, the whole college is the environmental, that's the, I think, the latest edition during the time of Dr. Vitasa. Um, Correct. Um, occupational health. Oc and occupational health. So, um, and that creates public health in itself. And of course, besides this, the, the College of Medicine. But it was an offshoot of uh, the pioneering act of Dr. Hilario Lara. And in the 70s, when the Western Pacific Regional Office of WHO became situated in Manila, uh, in at the United, United Nations, Nations Avenue, yes. you became a collaborating center. Yes. Which were in the, so, many of your faculty contributed to public health improvements yes. in other parts of the Western Pacific uh, regional member, member states. Correct? And I think many, some of the ministers are actually graduates of us. Our, in, yes. the in the region. In the region. I, I worked in uh, Malaysia as a professor and uh, many of the ministers of health in the different states would come to me and show me their uh, annual that they graduated from my university, the University of the Philippines. And it's the College of Public Health. That and it's actually from. the flagship uh, uh, for uh, their flagship programs, the Master in Public Health of which uh, I think uh, several secretaries of health are already also, also uh, including uh, your, yes. probably your next guest. And uh, there's also the master in hospital administration and of course the masters in occupational health. And our dear chancellor is a graduate of the masters in health policy studies. So, um, of which also my department, it's, it's, part, it's under my department, the health policy and administration. So that is how it started, so the part of the history and how we're trying to contribute. And it should be, I mean, it is a partner of the Department of Health all throughout that time. Not just the Department of Health, but the World Health Organization and, and uh, all throughout the region in order to achieve what was established in 1979, the primary health care, of which this all started. Uh, is this continuing? Because I, I found it, it has lacking. Evolved. Because it has evolved. I come from the University of the Philippines and then when I was under Secretary of Health, I wanted to see a lot of that government-to-government -government links between the Department of Health and I think the there was College a, of Public Health. I think there was a time that there was, uh, of course, they were engaging, as I've said in the history, but there was also a time that it, I think, waned. Waned, yes. But yes. now there's a resurgence. Yeah, I noticed there was that. A resurgence. We have many. Uh, and, uh, yeah, as the Chancellor would say, it's not just many. There, there's numerous, uh, and that's it's different. And it's all so the, the future <clears throat> seems to be that the College of Public Health and the National Institutes of Health in UP Manila Will play, uh, will intertwine itself with the Department of yes, Health. Yes, and it complements the 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 efforts of the Department of Health in achieving what you said, kalusugan pangkalatan, 
or universal healthcare, which you started when you were... Uh, in, in fact, uh, I think uh, the Swilling Family Foundation is offering something to the College of Public Health as well, uh, right? I think the Chancellor... Uh, the uh, Chancellor. Uh, Chancellor. Uh, but let, let me go to what Swilling Family Foundation does. Uh, you've also... Uh, you're in the private sector. You're a non-profit. Uh, why was help chosen by your group I mean, to assist? Uh, were there many gaps in your experience? And what were those gaps on the ground level? Um, we, Ted, we worked really on uh, looking at outcomes in the beginning. And we found out that, um, you know, uh, wait, 10 years ago, really the health outcomes of the Filipinos is somewhat lagging behind the health outcomes of our neighboring countries. I guess... At this point, it's still the same. So, so the core of the work is how do we improve health so outcomes? So when you look at health outcomes, you talked about infant mortality, Ma maternal, uh, maternal, maternal mortality, deaths, yes, uh, maternal deaths, NCDs, non-communicable non diseases, diseases okay, nutrition. Okay. So that was the focus. So that was, the, that was really the core. How do we improve this? And we found out that um, really the main responsibility at that time and until this point of time is really with the local government units, primarily because of the devolved setup yes. of health. Hence, uh, 10 years ago, we started working with um, several municipalities. There was a change, right? Because in 1991, we decentralized healthcare. Correct. And uh, the, in the era before 91, it was a centralized health system wherein the College of Public Health had an active role. When the district health system, the provincial hospitals, and some regional hospitals were devolved to provinces, the control of health transferred from the Department of Health to local chief executives, Correct. the mayor, the, the governor. governor. Okay. And in fact, it was really fragmented in the sense that um, curative care or hospitals was under the governors. Yes. And preventive care was, was under the mayor so, or so, under, is under the mayor. So the continuum of health, the health system, preventive, promotion, uh, emergency care, acute care, definitive care, were all given to, to different members of the government. Correct. Um, so hence, you know, we thought, what do we need to and do? And that led to the poor health outcomes. Exactly. Because of the fragmentation, right? Exactly, because there's no continuity of care. Correct. Um, so, so we started working with... Yeah, actually, um, the local parlance then is that people said, na politika. Well, the, it, the politicalization of the health system led to doctors resigning from the district health system, from the provincial hospital and look, going to the private sector. Yeah. There was a migration to the private and, sector. And I think at that time as well, you know, they devolved the, the responsibility to provide these services to these local government units. But somehow in terms of financing, um, I mean, the, the finance work was work, kept at yeah, central government. Correct, correct. So I think that that's what, that, what, uh, that was uh, correct, the issue correct, then. So, so we started working with mayors. And um, unfortunately, also at that time, you know, it, it's kind of difficult for to convince them to really prioritize health as an issue, both governors and mayors, primarily because health is intangible, mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, compared to building basketball courts, building roads. So, so they, they do not invest in health. Dryer, the basketball court can be used as entertainment well, and dryer for the grain, etc. Exactly. So we started working with mayors and convinced them somehow to really prioritize health as an issue. Um, and uh, after several years, of course, we found out that, that it really improved the health outcomes. You had the statistics. You presented it to us. Exactly. During and your time. During um, my time, with, yes. um, You improved mortality. The mortality went down. In, the in, infant mortality, correct. the maternal mortality went down. Just by educating the mayors. The mayors, by, by, by providing leadership and governance interventions. Uh, why health is important, correct. why health services are important. Correct. Um, but there was still a gap. Yes. And this is really in relation to the curative services, because at the time we found out more that complex they're complex. now dying in hospitals, Correct. no longer in their homes. Uh, and the hospital not, was under the governor. The governor. Uh, so sometimes they're not the same party. Exactly. The mayor is in a, uh, the opposite party, and the uh, Correct. governor is another party. Correct. So now we began working with governors for them to address their hospitals, and, 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 and it improved practically. Um, so that's where our work is now really doing work with, with... Because many of the governors during that time, prior to me becoming undersecretary, was they wanted to re-nationalize their hospital because they found out it was expensive, expensive. to run Correct. a 150-bed hospital. Correct. So they said, they'll pass, ask their congressman 
to just pass a law to renationalize and give it back to the Department of Health. So because as he and said, the money wasn't transferred to them. Correct, and it was a political um, issue for them because they get criticized in the radio, in their radio programs when they don't deliver the, the services. Hence, in the last cycle of our intervention in our program, we worked with governors for them to integrate the system, that they work with mayors and that they work with their hospital chiefs on really integrating um, um, the health system. And I think this is where the universal health care bill or law is really it's gearing on. towards now, yeah, really yeah, the I'm integration good. at the provincial level. So we hope to work in that direction. So it's not really us lagging behind with what is being... Everything, I think, is falling into place. Yes. So, of course, it's a long way to universal health care per se. The, of course, it, the law says, as long as you are Filipino now, that you are covered. And, and, and that's my criticism to some people who talk about universal health coverage or universal health, health system strengthening. It's because they don't understand the context. I may be a more senior doctor having worked and seen the system as it grew from the time we were medical students, Manchit is a few years ahead of me, <laughs> to, uh, to, to today. And uh, we've seen how practice, research, education has changed, even the, the, the political side. So what do you think? Uh, I'll ask you, because that question is an important question to me. We decentralized healthcare. Was that a good thing or a bad thing? Uh, it's, I, I, would, I would always tell my students an analogy. So it's like uh, in the United States, uh, I think it, you, you're 21. I think that's the legal you have to separate. So uh, it's you're just on your like, own. No, you're, you're, you're on, on your own. own. <laughs> so that is, I think, what happened there. So um, we are what? Uh, the Miss Universe uh, contestants would say 7,107 islands uh, when slow tide or uh, different tide, it's uh, another islands. It's fragmented. Each of those has a mind of its own. And in the bold uh, setup, each one knows its own problems. Each one knows its own resources. They can address their. Uh, so that's I think is the, the specific. But not everyone was ready. Correct. I agree with that. So not all yeah. children who part with their parents are ready. In, in fact, that's what I think was was wrong with what happened then. What happened then is we just woke up one morning. And the already, health system yeah, was already it's, fragmented it's, yeah. into three. But you have to do it now. But it looks like it's the law. And because it's the law. But I think people should have studied because some provinces, those provinces were in the family name of the local chief executive does not change, but the first name changes. They were able to build strong health system because of the continuity. And as you know, health systems are more continuous. So those are things that were not taken into consideration in the principle of implementing decentralization. The, the nature and spirit of the law is good. good. Yes, yes. Yeah, I, agree. No, I, I think agree. there's we no all argument. Agree. And I think primarily we all agree. because I mean the local governments are really close to the people. I yes, think yes. But there should be uh, you know like conducting a symphony. There should be harmony also. So when you say you go this way, you should capacitate that person. They were not to ready. Go. They were not ready. But now in a devolved system, the Department of Health is merely on a guiding. So it develops the policy, and then it hands it over. This is the direction to go. But how about the human resources? You know, the six, again, we, boil, we bring it back to the... So I'll ask you an academic question that makes it more, even more complicated. We're talking about a federal form of government. And there is a proposal for federal. Well, you're, you're putting me in the spot. <laughs> I think it's beyond my... But, uh, no, but I just want to know your opinion, because I don't think they're consulting, again, the health professionals and the health the health policy people, they're just creating this uh, new framework to implement uh, equity in governance, but they're forgetting that it might destroy again our, because we decentralized, we got rumbled up, then we built up with PhilHealth and we built up with Syntax, and we're now at a point where we can actually deliver better services, and then we're going to change it again with the federal government. Actually, the law, the universal healthcare law now, is trying to remedy uh, that by uh, providing an SDN, the Service Delivery, service delivery network. network, which is an effective functioning health systems with the partnership of the private and all of us. Yeah, well, before you know, we call that the local health system. Yes, it's, the, it's the SDN. It's, yeah. So, in, in effect, it's actually uh, giving a solution to the Correct. problem that was already encountered before. You are not ready. 
but here is now the SDN. And but, there's a partner. But uh, you said if you're going to federalism, like uh, the devolution is like we're on steroids going there. So um, federalism is the real thing now. You're, you're really on your own. But are you really ready? So readiness is defined in so many aspects as well. Human resources. Again, you, if it's the health system, you, you deal with the six building blocks. So I'll go to Menchit because Menchit did a program that is quite interesting and solves this uh, fragmented health system. Can you talk about the uh, School for Health Sciences and our graduates from the Ladderize Program for Health, health Professionals and how the, it helped their communities? And actually, UP Manila has nine academic uh, units that's from medicine nursing public health dentistry and so on but one of the academic units actually the school for health sciences school for health sciences and um, where is the campus of that we have three right now right one now. in baler one in coronadal and oh. one in uh, uh, palo where palo is, is where a it all started, yes where yes it all started. i i think you know this is i would like to look at this as a very successful model because yes. whereas we talk about brain drain and people leaving here is one program wherein I'm able to keep the graduates, 90% of my graduates here in the Philippines. In the local community, not yes, only in the yes. Philippines. Yes, yes. My the... retention rate is 90%. Wow. The, the recruitment of the student is actually from the community. Uh, so you get the top high school graduates in the well, public school it's, system? They have to be nominated by uh, the local government because okay. they have to go back to the so government again, afterwards. So it's a, they really are connected to the local unit. But it's a ladder rise program wherein uh, they start as a midwife and then they have to become, they will become a nurse and then become a doctor. But if you look at the program intertwined in the academic component is the return service. Yes. So what's happening now is that uh, I guess, you know, the love for, the, for your home is really, it, it grows with the program. So what is important now is that uh, the recruitment, as I said, from the community is maybe one of the major factors why it is a very successful program. It may be a good model that can be considered, you know, down the line. We're actually setting up two more campuses at the moment for, for this. Luck, for this right? unit. We have two more that's coming up. But maybe, um, maybe that's one model. I think, you know, what we should do for our, for, for the I new concept. it's a successful model yes. of the training. Uh, it's step ladder, right? They it's step ladder. Free, and then, and then nursing, they can go to nursing if they're and then, intelligent. And then they and then, can go to medicine. Well, if they want to become a doctor. But uh, as, as we talk about new reforms right now, what I'm seeing is we should really look at the best practices from the community, the private sector, from the academe, and see which, one, which ones will align with the new reforms that we want Correct. to institute. We don't have to start all over again. But without the proper modeling for these new concepts, it's going to be very difficult. My second comment is that we cannot just change things overnight. The transition, actually, to the, new ref to the reform system is going to be crucial. So the transition may take, it may really take yes. them. It, well, what, the milestones, I think, for the transition is going to be crucial. So they're really very innovative solutions, right? From this stepladder model of health human resource, which is, a, which is an answer to brain drain. You also did something in the UP Manila that actually is now being copied, right? The doctors of medicine were asked to sign a contract when they enter medical school. You know, I might have a daughter who's studying now yes, in medicine. Uh, yeah. I have to sign a contract. Can you explain this return of service agreement? So um, the return uh, service agreement actually is, uh, it's really a, a platform wherein our graduates can serve the country before they decide on leaving the country. Yeah, they're scholar okay. ng bayan, yes. right? They're so, so but, but the concept is, depending on the duration of their uh, curriculum, it ranges from two to three years. But it's really just to stay in the country and serve the country. Um, majority of them still stay behind, uh, in fairness. I, very few really decide to leave. But I think what's important is that the return service agreement is actually, it really concretizes the, the opportunity to really serve in the country after you graduate. Correct. I think the, the important thing is that you're doing your service, return service after you graduate because you're already a professional that can really, you know, who can help the, the Filipino patient. In, in fact, what happened there is when we created that return service agreement and I was at the Department of Health, I noticed that many of those that signed up for the Doctor to the Barrios program, which is a program of the DOH to serve doctorless areas, 
many of them were coming from that return service agreement model, signing up to work one, two years, and then earn a master's in public management together with the service. Um, I think what is important for us, uh, government and the Department of Health and Academy, is if we really want the return service agreement to be implemented nationwide, we have to create the opportunities where they will go. Because right now, uh, for the return service agreement that we are implementing, the graduate has to look for the job or look for the residency, and there's really no budget for their funding. With the law not right now, mm -hmm. I can see that they will be employed by government, which I think is an improvement of what we're offering. So uh, once again, I'm saying that UP Manila is willing to look at many other models. We have many lessons to share. So as we expand this on a national scale, we'll be more than happy to, to share how we worked out nursing, uh, public therapy, health. Mm -hmm. public health, because there are many lessons to learn uh, as we move forward and make it successful. But I would like to think that the Return Service Agreement is a very successful program of the University of the Philippines, Manila. I think you also have another program that's worth uh, mentioning in this episode. There is a regionalization program yes. as well. Yeah, Could you explain that a bit? Um, this has been going on for decades yes, now, yeah. even, even, even when, during my time, yes. even when uh, Dr. Ted and I were students. But a certain, it's unheard of, people don't know it. A but. certain percentage of students that get into the College of Medicine actually come from the provinces. There is a co commitment to go back to the province. Yeah. So it's a, uh, uh, when you come into the College of Medicine, there are many, uh, either you get the regular program, one, become an MD-PhD, you become a PhD after your medicine. We'll talk about the MD-PhD yes. next. <laughs> and and the, the thing is, uh, for the regionalization, there is a number of slots we're in, I have committed to actually go back to a distant island after I get there. So it's a different track that you're getting into. Once again, that is, that's a very good model. And right. I think we should really increase the number of slots because that means you've got a doctor that's going back to that province or to that community. And all we need to do as a university is coordinate with the Department of Health and the DILG and ask, and maybe it's really, and ask them where are the doctorless areas that you need a young graduate to go to. So very interesting. So how about this MD-PhD? You mentioned MD-PhD, so I'll have to uh, grab you on that one. It's, uh, we just graduated uh, last year, right? Yes, you, we started I was graduating, there the graduation yes. that You had four graduates yes. of the MD-PhD yes, yes. program. So the MD-PhD program is another track for a doctor. You become a physician and a scientist at the same time, which means you extend another three years to finish your, your uh, dissertation so that you become a PhD. So in other words, if you look at the, the field of health, it's not only doctors or nurses or midwives that you need or therapists. We need public health people. We need, we need people who should stay in the academy and teach. Right. We, should, we need people who will go into deep research and deep get research, deep yes. research basic and then research. do basic research to come up with new ideas, innovative, new knowledge, innovative, innovative changes in So that we can systems. actually produce products that will be useful to our people. So I think when you look at health, you cannot just look at a, clin you cannot just look at a clinician. Correct. Not only not, services. Not, not only, only services, health services. Because you need to create the PhD scientists that yes. will change the way we care for That's diseases right. that we have in the Philippines. And I just want to mention that the Philippines is very unique. Whatever you say, uh, you cannot say you can copy what the next door country is doing. Correct. We have to generate our own data so that we can come up with a diagnostic kit that is aligned to the Filipino people. Our genes are different. Mm -hmm. So um, I guess, you know, my message is that uh, when I talk about we want doctors, we have many kinds of doctors. Mm -hmm. Doctors who will become public health people, who will teach, who will become Policy. clinicians, and then you can be scientists. And we have more tracks that are available for the, for the, for the students right now. I just want to mention Dr. Ted. Uh, the current dean, Dean Chong, actually recently did a survey of um, uh, medical students. Uh, about 800, about 600 actually responded. And I just want to mention that quite a big number of medical students want to go to policy. And I am really happy I about that. this. I noticed yes. that. Because uh, it's very important that our medical students understand the importance of policy to change the quality of health that we will give our people. So can you, can you answer that? Is the College of Public Health ready to accept more than how many students? Half of the students wanting to go into health policy? Actually, Hundreds. the College of Public Health is not ready. The College of Public Health is already doing it. So, <laughs> actually, the College of Public Health is already to talk with Dean Charlotte Chong. Not just the PhD part, but 
uh, we're talking about masters in hospital administration, masters in occupational health, masters in public health, as well as the uh, 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 health policy. Yeah. Uh, so, so, Dr. Ted, what we're saying now is that we want a, a doctor, instead of graduating from an MD PhD, might graduate from an MD MS in health policy. Yes. yes. Well, question. You seeing all the programs being done at uh, the academe? Are you seeing this on the ground? <laughs> well, well, we've we've observed that with the uh, graduates of UP really do, going into the Health doctors policy. of the barrios program uh -huh. and then eventually becoming policymakers as well. But I think what's critical there is also them doing research, but what's more important is that this research is translated into policies and are implemented correctly uh, by, our government, by our government. By our government. So I think with so the, we need to deliver the experience to government so that it can be really implemented as a true policy. Correct. And with that, I think we already have a cadre of good doctors that are researchers, that are policy makers and implementers, young doctors at that, who would really make a difference in terms of you know, improving, and again, I'm repeating myself, improving health outcomes of our country. So the future looks bright. Uh, I have a few more minutes and I'll give uh, one to two minutes each for each of you to give your final message about your field of expertise? I think the, the future looks bright for the Philippines. Um, as you said, uh, the enabling, there should be an enabler. You might have a noble idea, but there should be enablers. And policy plays a big part there. Policy and, of course, the capacitation. The academe plays a big part there. And the cooperation with the private sector, everything will fall into place only if we uh, work on it together. Uh, everything in harmony, just like an, an orchestra. orchestra. There's percussion, there's uh, wind, and the, but there must be a coordination between all to uh, at least see that whole of government approach working to achieve a common goal. So, <clears throat> amen, to, amen to that, uh, Mayor. But uh, the academe is definitely going to work with government. Mm -hmm. We will give what the government needs. And what is important is that I think for UP Manila, we will, we will provide models and examples that can be used for, by government. So we're behind every step of the wonderful, way. Wonderful, wonderful. Yep. Yeah, for the non-government organization and specifically for the Zwilig Family Foundation, we really support the initiatives of the government. Um, and in so doing, uh, we support them improving their health outcomes, capacitating the leaders and the implementers as well. Um, so as really there's a whole of government and a whole of society approach in this whole scheme of things. So um, we hope that um, the universal healthcare law would really revolutionize the healthcare system and eventually improve the health outcomes. Thank you, Tony Boy. Well, technically we're seeing that there's a lot of change and reform happening in our health system. And what I've heard is uh, we want harmony. We want health and we want harmony. And the system will work if everyone contributes their own share in terms of achieving better health outcomes. Uh, this is Dr. Teddy Herbosa. Thank you very much to our guests, Dr. Emmer Faraon, uh, Chancellor Menchit Padilla, and Tony Boy Faraon for enlightening us on all the issues in the health systems and health reform of our country.